In February, church leaders presented a letter to Downing Street urging the government not to include everyday church activities in its proposed conversion therapy ban. The signatories warned the government that they are prepared to be criminalised if an overly broad ban which covers preaching, prayer and pastoral care is introduced. That letter was signed by more than 2,500 Christian ministers and pastoral workers. In response, LGBT activists publicly shared their names and church details on social media, warning people not to attend those churches, claiming they could be unsafe. One of the most prominent activists, Jane Ozan, even publicly accused them of abusing LGBT people. Two of the authors of the letter are paediatrician and youth worker, Dr Julie Maxwell, and the Associate Director of Church Society, Dr Ros Clark. Thank you both for speaking with me today. Before we get on to the pushback, I would just like to start by asking if you could set out uh, what your concerns are over the proposed conversion therapy ban. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the legislation that the government is committed in some way to banning something which is called conversion therapy is very unclear about what it actually thinks conversion therapy is. And as you already mentioned, it seems incredibly broad in scope, including things you know like rape in the same kind of way as a conversation that a youth worker might have with someone in their, their youth group. It seems to have so little grasp of, of the way in which Christian ministry works, what normal teaching and preaching and one-to-one -one work and small group work and even just Christian friendships and Christian parents with their own children might be, that it seems to have inadvertently included a whole lot of things that we wouldn't see in any way as being therapy or even to do with conversion but would just be normal Christian ministry so we are very concerned because it, it does seem as though and and I do think that it is inadvertent at least on the part of the government would actually criminalize um, a lot of what we would uh, normally be doing in our churches so so obviously there's a concern there yeah I, I completely agree and, and I think what's what is all interesting about this as well is that you know that it's not just Christians that are, are concerned about this ban. Um, it, it's it's other religions and and even LGBT groups themselves um, and, and 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 other people are concerned about. Um, I think some of the inadvertent ways that young people and, and adults will not be able to seek the help that they want because you know particularly for young people, um, you know teenage years are about. Uh, you know, exploring who you are, your sexuality, your gender, especially in the society we're living in at the moment. And if those kind of conversations could end up being deemed conversion therapy, it, it will be Christians, it will be um, medical professionals, it will be all sorts of people who will be afraid to have those conversations. Um, and, and young people will be afraid to talk about those kind of issues. And, and that is just a, a huge concern. In one way, the legislation, I think, is almost discriminatory against people who are LGBTQ or exploring those issues. As a person who is uh, heterosexual, you're completely free to continue seeking the counselling and support that you need, whether that's to live a life uh, as a celibate single person, whether you're somebody who might be struggling with issues of porn addiction or struggling in your marriage, you, is, you would still be completely free to seek all the support that you need from your church. But if those issues were connected with same-sex attraction, you would not. And, and so I think actually it's also being harmful, would be harmful um, actually to the very people it's, it's intending to protect. So uh, let's, let's get into the, the pushback. You, uh, there was a, a small group of the authors went to, went to Down Street, they presented, uh, presented the letter, but really just representing the views of a couple of thousand uh, other um, church leaders, pastoral workers, um, uh, uh, and so on. As a result, details have been shared uh, about um, churches. Churches have been warned to stay away, you know, or people have been warned stay away from these churches. There's even been that accusation um, of abuse that that I referred to, and that's been that's been sort of the group has been branded with. How? How are you two dealing with that? I think for me, 
I have found that in the last couple of weeks, I've had a lot of people reach out to me very concerned. Are you all right, Roz? Because the, the, obviously it's not a nice thing ever to have somebody accuse you of being an abuser and particularly to do so in that very public way. I have my social media mostly pretty locked down for a variety of, of other reasons. And I have not gone seeking out uh, the trolls, not just the uh, original posts from Joe Nozan, but I believe there've been a whole lot of, of other things as well. And uh, I have not felt it necessary to go and see what pe things people might be saying about me. What has happened, which actually has been quite a positive thing, is people who are my friends, who are not Christians, some of them uh, who identify as uh, LGBT in various ways or genderqueer or whatever, it's actually provided an opportunity to have conversations uh, with one or two of them that have been kind and, and gracious and generous. And we've come to points where we've been able to say, well, we do disagree, but I don't think that makes you a bad person. One of my friends began that conversation by saying, Ros, I do not think you are an abuser, but let's talk about the letter because I don't think I agree with it. So for me personally, it's actually not been a difficult time. Julie, I don't know if your experience has been different. Um, I mean, I'm I, I'm no stranger to on, on online um, attacks, I suppose. Um, so it, it's not it's not the first time this has happened. I think I think for for me, it, you know, when you get attacked online for things like this, it, it's because what what you're saying makes sense um mm -hmm. and and so people are viewing it as as some kind of threat and i think i think i think where it does bother me is that you know i i i'm involved in in the, the sort of supporting children with gender dysphoria and and supporting young people generally um because i care about them um and because i want the best for them you know as a pediatrician you know i i always want the best for children um, and young people and and i think when you're being accused of not doing that that is hard because it, it's going against you know what 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 we want you know and and you know the, the the bottom line is you just want the best for for young people um and and as a christian wanting the best for young people means we want them to follow jesus um and and so it, it's hard when uh people um mis misread your motives i suppose or, or or kind of you know misquote you and and make it out that you're you're being abusive or uncaring or, or not loving people um that i think i think that i would say is is, is the hardest bit do you think it's a sign that those who fundamentally disagree with your position disagree with our position at the christian institute um that they are feeling concerned that they're losing the argument I suspect that some of this is linked with, and certainly um, Jane Ozan's involvement would suggest this, is linked with the process that is happening in the Church of England at the moment, um, the living in love and faith process in which we're uh, discussing once again the issues around sexuality and gender and, and whether the church might make some changes to its doctrine and its practice on that. That is due to be debated uh, by General Synod within the next 12 to 18 months. I think it is going to be extremely hotly debated. I think since the um, General Synod elections last year, it's become clear that there isn't a, a clear majority uh, on either side of, of that position. It's not going to be certainly pushed through. It's not gonna be certain yet. I think that it will be um, uh, voted against. And so I think there may be a, an aspect of trying to win that battle in social media, in the, the sort of hearts and minds of people before it gets to the debating chamber so that it becomes a foregone conclusion. There may be an aspect of, of wanting uh, to make it so difficult for people to stand up for biblical orthodoxy in this, knowing that you know, they will get into contact with people's churches, that they will be bad mouthing people, uh, in all kinds of ways that would make life quite difficult as a way of um, putting people off perhaps uh, voting in a particular way. I suspect we are all going to see in the next couple of years a huge rise in the, the sort of temperature uh, of this um, debate and it's not going to be pleasant for anyone. 
I'm, I'm getting the sense from both of you that um, the, the social media pushback hasn't hasn't affected you in the sense of sort of changing your opinion or or making you sort of shrink away from the argument. But do you um, do you sense any kind of uh, wider impact on Christians where uh, there's any feeling of, well, maybe I should maybe I should stay quiet, you know, or, you know, is it a case of um, people keeping their heads down or is it a case of w if we weren't convinced that this is about attacking mainstream Christian theology before, then we are certainly convinced about it now? Yeah, I mean, I think I, th I think one of the things uh, about the letter was having two and a half thousand people signing it. I think, you know, there is there is some solidarity in numbers, isn't there? You know, where one person wouldn't necessarily be brave enough to put the head above the parapet, you know, actually that number of people, it, you know, it hopefully will embolden Christians to actually say, yes, you know, I do need to speak out about this. And and I and I think that the backlash to it has has proved our point really that you know although people would you know lots of people say oh well of course conversion therapy is bad you know and, and of course what a lot of people mean by conversion therapy the you know electric shock therapy coercion sure. yeah. you know abusive things clearly is wrong we would absolutely agree that, that that's wrong but but you know people i think there are lots of people who hadn't realized that normal christian ministry would fall under the, the the sort of I was going to say the broad definition or the lack of definition of conversion therapy as, as Ros said earlier mm -hmm. um, you know it, it I think people don't realise that and I, and I and I'm hoping actually that 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 the backlash to this means that people will realise that that you know even people who maybe were saying they they supported the conversion therapy ban and and I think many in general synod supported it. Um, but I, I suspect some of those people didn't actually realise what it was that they were putting their support behind. They thought they were um, putting support behind outlawing abusive practices when, when in fact it, it included normal church ministry. Mm. Mm. Yes, I certainly don't get any sense of people uh, starting to back down because of what's happened online. I think um, actually it's, it's making people see this isn't something that that is going to going away. This isn't something where we can just be nice to people and and that will all work itself out. But actually, it is something where we're going to need to take a stand. Uh, and you know, two and a half thousand people saying that they are willing to be criminalised if what they see as their God given role in ministry is criminalised. I think that is a huge encouragement, isn't it? Um, and you know, if they if they want to arrest one of us, are they going to arrest all of us? I, you know, I think, as Julie says, there's real strength in numbers. And I think that's a really encouraging thing uh, for people to see and be willing to take their stand. Well, the Christian Institute has said that it will uh, take legal action if the government uh, does go ahead with a, a broadband that does affect um, preaching and prayer and pastoral care and has an impact on parents uh, and so on. We must, of course, pray that uh, in the meantime that we don't have to go down that road. Well, thank you both for speaking with me and thank you both for standing up for the ordinary work of churches. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.